We have to recognize as we travel the underground like world that there's trauma there that's so sensitive that if we bring any type of research, we also have to bring some healing component. Welcome to New Thinking from the Center for Court Innovation. I'm Matt Watkins. Why do some young people, especially young men, carry guns? It turns out that's a very difficult question to answer. People in heavily policed neighborhoods with high rates of violence are not generally enthusiastic when it comes to answering questions about guns. Today, we're going to hear about a remarkable year-long study into gun use and young people in New York City by some of my colleagues at the Center for Court Innovation. It's work that paints a disturbing portrait of daily life in some of the city's most marginalized communities, a portrait rendered very often in the words of the young people themselves. Experiences of violence among the 330 people interviewed were almost universal, witnessing family members being shot, being shot at themselves, being attacked with another weapon. Equally widespread were negative experiences with the justice system. Almost all had been arrested, often many times over, and participants expressed a near wholesale distrust of police. Indeed, along with the constant fear of gang-related violence, many cited the fear of being killed by police as a primary reason for carrying. But if the goal is to learn from embattled communities what they need to combat gun use, then as important as the findings is the way the work was done. The work in the field was approved by an institutional review board, and that work establishing trust, negotiating with gang leaders, finding participants, the hours of conversation, that work was done by researchers with deep and direct experience of the networks they were trying to access. This is what's called participatory research. You're also going to hear a lot about RDS. That stands for Respondent Driven Sampling. It's a technique for working with hard to reach populations, especially when illegal behavior is involved. You start by identifying a small number of so-called gatekeeper participants and then rely on them to do the rest of the recruiting amongst their peers. The RDS stations you'll hear about were part of that effort, set up in places where young people already congregated. All right, so you're going to hear now from three of the folks who did this work, which culminated in the report, Got to Make Your Own Heaven, Guns, Safety, and the Edge of Adulthood in New York City. Angelica Maria Camacho, or Angie, uh, coordinated the work in the field. Basim Spate uh, was brought onto the project because of his experience of gang life, uh, and as you'll hear, that experience quickly became indispensable. And Elise White, who will be the third voice to chime in, was one of the co-directors of the overall work. And I should say, all three are now part of a team doing similar research in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, uh, which you'll hear them reference a few times. I started the interview by asking Angie to talk about what made this population of young people so hard to access. What makes it so hard is that they have to protect themselves against everything. So like, I'll give you, I'll give you an example, right? So when we first started doing research in the Butler houses. That, that's a public housing development, right? Yeah, that's about public housing. So we were doing some interviews in Butler houses and Webster houses, right? And the first time that we went out there, the neighborhood was completely dry. And when I say that a neighborhood is dry, I mean, there's nobody outside. There's nobody in front of delis and nobody at corners. And as I was walking around, I was talking to community members and I picked up information that in the last week there was a raid where um, the police came and took hundreds of youth. So I'm coming into that network at the same time that a police raid just happened. That makes hidden populations go more underground because now there's a threat to their livelihoods if they remain exposed. So like they can literally be moving about in the project development and be visible to cops who then take them. We're talking about populations who are literally living by different rules than the normal person. Because imagine living in your own neighborhood and not being safe in every single block that you walk. There's police danger. And then there's also like petty gang beefs in the same area. It is a very hard population to reach because if you're somebody like me, when I first got into the Butler houses, you have to remember that I'm also a light skinned Puerto Rican. So even though I live close enough to the Butler houses to literally walk there, I'm also 
a light-skinned Puerto Rican who has light skin privilege. So if I'm going into this network, even accepting me may be hard to my own people. And Basim, could you talk a little bit about the, the background and the history that you brought into this work? So like I grew up in a foster system, moved around a little bit, a lot actually in these different type of families and these different type of religious families. When I got a little bit older, I went to go try to like find my family and I wasn't able to because my parents had, unfortunately they had passed away. My father had got shot in his leg and hit a main artery and died and my mother had an older overdose. But then one of my older brothers, I found out he got killed by the cops in Newark and then I was cool with one of my other brothers and then he got shot and killed. That kind of like messed me up a little bit, but through my adventures or whatnot going around, I was able to, uh, I got into the gang thing, right? So um, I got into the gangs when I was in Florida and I got into the bloods. So I really got into that because uh, I felt like, like in my foster, in these foster families that I was in, I wasn't getting that like type of attention or, the, or that love or whatnot. And I always wondered like where my parents was in this, in this world. So I went to Florida, I went to Georgia, I went to North Carolina, New Jersey, and then I just settled in New York. And New York like became my home because that's where like the original, like where the bloods had came from. So it was like the home for it. So all, all through all these moves, the gangs are a kind of constant source of support in some ways. Yes, yeah, definitely a support for individuals like me who's like seeking that type of support. And that's where gangs had came. I believe like gangs was created because of that, because of oppression in their neighborhood, because of the lack of support or whatnot, or the lack of government support. So I did my thing around in the gangs thing, got my reputation up. And then um, this program came into our neighborhood, SOS. And uh, so that's Save Our Streets, right? Which is a program we run, Center for Court Innovation, right? Putting putting violence interrupters into neighborhoods where there's a lot of violence, right? Yes. And then what there was like, I think like SOS, like model or whatnot was similar. It's very similar to like gang knowledge about protecting your community, about raising consciousness in your community or whatnot. So I think a lot of dudes can relate to that and understand that. But what really helps with really doing the work is like they get getting paid to do the work in their neighborhood, which is like a big plus, right? Because a lot of us don't have that opportunity to get employed because of lack of education or lack of opportunity. And then like the neighborhood started to change because like the little homies started looking at these big homies making this change and whatnot and doing this work and really stopping gun violence in the neighborhood. So like homies like me wanted to be a part of that. So I got into it and I got all these trainings and I had gained all these skill sets. And then I was able to like really stop shootings in my neighborhood, which was like huge for me at that time because I had children. I had boys that walked around in that neighborhood. So. Uh, the work had really became important to me at that time or whatnot. And then for who I am in that neighborhood, like it was like people respect it. So I think like a lot of like my skill sets that's similar to this work came from SOS. So I was able to transition that. So when I came on to the researcher onto the project, I was brought on as security to uh, like watch with Angie. And at that time they had, um, a bunch of like college researchers at that time. Oh, can I jump in? Can I jump in yes. real quick? Basim, I love that you said that because um, just to give you a little background about why we needed Basim. So when Basim came to the Butler houses, at that point, we were still um, running RDS with, with me. But um, after ha having him come on as crowd control and then start interviewing, I think we started to see new type of changes coming to the RDS station where we, that we didn't have before just because of his presence alone. To the point that um, because Basim was able to come up to the RDS station and peace people, because he was able to come up to the RDS station and tell the people in the network what set he was from and what status he was in the set, that helped the network feel more comfortable and safe for, for society, 
Basim would be labeled as somebody who was unsafe. But this network right here, these are the gatekeepers that protect them from uh, actually the same people who call them monsters. So the RDS station started to kind of like come to life in a different way when we hired him. So much so that um, there was one man in the network, his name was William Rivera. He started to come to that RDS station every day. He started to look up to Basim as a big homie. And he was also part of a blood set. I felt like um, when Will came into the picture, he was like the, the catalyst between research coming over to like more of a gang network and then the gang coming over to research. Because for the first time ever, we all looked at William as a human being that we all cared for and that we all understood differently. Like Basim understood him because of his relationship to the gang. So he understands what William goes through every day. And we understood William as somebody, who, as a participant who needed help and extra resources. So when we got together to help Will and literally in every way that we could, we started to see and negotiate for the first time, like how far do you wanna take this research into your neighborhood and what benefit are we gonna get out of it? And how far are we gonna push CCI to try something new? Because we knew we had two battles to fight. We had to fight a battle at CCI, which is like, all right, we have researchers, everyone, but guess what? They have no education, haven't had jobs for years, but we know that they can if do ever. this work. Yeah, if ever, but we know that they can do this. And then for the gang, it's like- And, they, and they're the only people who can yes, do this. Exactly. Yes. yes, exactly. They're <laughs> like, the only people. Because I will <laughs> add, actually, before Angie even came onto the project, the, staff, the project had a completely different staffing structure. So there are a lot of different iterations and ways that we try to do this. And this is literally the only way that we could have done it. A, a question for Basim then. Basim, when, when you joined onto the project, what did you think about the way they were going about things and, and looking for people? And I, I'd uh, ask you here to be as candid as possible with your colleagues. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like when I was doing the security part and I was able to like really watch how they really worked and their approach or whatnot and how they was dressing coming to the field and who they was, it was like, and then I was noticing like the area that we was in. So I knew it was like a blood neighborhood. This is the Bronx, this deep in the Bronx or whatnot. The real crazy project is like two blocks away from there. I know they be beefing. So I'm like, what the fuck is they doing? Like not, if they was gonna get interviews, it was gonna be some like, bullshit interviews it was going to be like that surface level gangster you know what i'm saying who would just tell you anything type shit and then they was looking like the team that <laughs> like you could tell anything to and they'll believe honestly it was just that image that they hear was like presenting it just wasn't right for that type of work that they was doing because i understood the work that they was doing it was important work it was serious serious work and I think like for me like if that came into the, my neighborhood I would want to talk about that and I want to be a part of that but I want to talk about that and be a part of it of that with somebody who can relate and understand where I'm coming from and then to take just a step back for a minute Elise I mean we're, we're getting a sense already of how difficult it is to do research you know in this hidden population and around gun use what would you say is the, you know, the gap in knowledge that you guys were trying to fill in with this work? <laughs> it's a huge gap. There haven't been any qualitative studies, large qualitative studies since the 1990s. Um, meaning people who actually carry the guns have not even been able to express in their own words anything about it. It's researchers coming in, designing questions, like choose between these five answers. Then most studies that have been done at all take place in two places, either schools or prisons, or like in a, some sort of like incarceration context. And obviously what, what we know about schools is that young people who are still in school are probably not, not necessarily, but probably not as deep into street culture. So as Basim was saying, you know, like you're kind of already getting sort of the top level or the most sort of superficial level of all this stuff. It's not to say it's not important or it's not valuable, it's just not the same. And then if you're looking at prisons, I mean, it's just a whole different, especially if you're talking about attitudes, 
you just see a much different, I don't know, level of contemplation or um, all sorts of things from people who are incarcerated, from people who are not. So this is really the first time that a qualitative, it's mixed methods. So we asked closed-ended questions and then kind of exploratory questions. But it really is the first time that a large scale qualitative uh, study has been done with people just in their normal environment. If we turn to talk a little bit more about recruitment and the challenges there, how you get people to agree to participate in this study. Uh, Angie, you talked a little bit about it already, this idea of you, you're looking for gatekeepers. You're doing what you keep calling RDS, respondent driven sampling, meaning you find people who then can help you find other people and take you into these networks. So, I mean, it sounds like from reading the report that that was really a process of trial and error in some ways. What I've learned from doing RDS for like the past 10 years is that one thing always has to remain consistent with the seed. And so I wish to just say the seed is the person that takes you into the network. That takes you into the network. Yes. They have to be both bought into the mission and credible enough to carry out the mission in the network. And um, the lesson that I took away specifically from the gang network, this hidden population, is that it actually has to come with a, almost a lifestyle change. And this is what I mean by that. I feel that the woman that I was before my first RDS station in this project is not the woman that I am now. Because I literally, to kind of like travel with this population, have had to change like core components of my personality so that I can actually find a way to exist in both worlds. So when I'm thinking of seeds now, I'm thinking of somebody who is like Basim, who is navigating both worlds and has enough credibility to bring these new ideas to a population that might be like hesitant to accept anything that's new and foreign. And, and how, so how would you say you change though, as, as a result of this? I think that I've changed in the way that I understand power. I've changed in a way that I've understand just the sensitivity, like the sensitivities of language when you kind of code switch in different environments. And I've learned to understand that everybody needs help. But we have to recognize as we travel the underground like world that there's trauma there that's so sensitive that if we bring any type of research into these sensitive communities, we also have to bring some healing component, which we did in this project. And we call it emotional intelligence because without it, you won't have the energy that you need every day to go through kind of the darkness that people live with on a daily basis. I think that one thing that people of privilege, and when I say privilege, I'm even including us researchers who are able to go to a nine to five every day and able to have consistent income. When we go into these networks, we have to understand that this is a community of have nots. This is a community like filled with talent, this is a community filled with ideas who have constantly been silenced and literally beaten into submission by the NYPD and terrorized by the NYPD on a daily basis. So when people think, when people ignore the fact that our men and women feel like three fourths of a human because of the world that they live in, we have to kind of correct ourselves and we have to train that out of our psyche because conducting this research has taught me that if you don't understand the human component, you as a researcher will always default to numbers. And that's the danger because that's capitalism at its finest. I've changed a lot as a researcher. And I think that um, Basim has also changed a lot as a researcher as he's grown, because I think we understand that to help our community, we have to do things that are unconventional and take risks because that's how different their world is, and that's how unfair. I believe like everybody wants help. Like if my main question in the streets is like, um, I ask a lot of people like, do you want to die? Like, like nobody wants to die. Like nobody wants to die. Like I'm picking off like what Angie is saying. Is um, I'm sorry. Hold on. It's a lot. We've never actually sat down and talked about this. Yeah. But um, I think like for all of us, 
it changed all of us, especially me, like not even as a researcher, but like as a person to, um, like I changed so much on, like I understand like the humanity in this, I understand like compassion. And most of all, I, like I understand unconditional love. And the most I took from all of this is vulnerability. And I, I think I preach that a lot, and especially me and Elise, because I I took to be vulnerable with Elise. I took to be vulnerable with Angie. You could say, you could say risk or whatnot, but like just opening my my door, inviting them into my world, and them doing the reverse, right? With a like the same common goal. Like we might not have spoken about or defining like what our true goal is, but what not, but it's like unspoken. We have learned so much about each other that I think the world has not taken this risk that we have taken to like, let it go. Let all what society has told about us, all what we have learned, take the race and all that bullshit out the way and just look at us as us and what can we do together to help someone out here, right? For me, it's like, I have to do this because like for my, I'm upset that like my history of my people are slaves, you know what I'm saying? And then some people feel like in this world that this black community or this brown, these brown communities can do it on their own, which they cannot. You understand what I'm saying? They cannot rise on their own. How could they when they came out of slavery, then right after slavery, it's Jim Crow, then right after that, we go into the civil rights era. When we're looking at these kids today, you have to understand that this trauma and this, all this, this anger and this, this confusion and this lack of consciousness and mental health and all this has extended from that. So when you go on in to do this work, you have to understand that. You cannot be judgmental because once you go on judging of what society have taught you, you're not really there to do the work. You're not coming with unconditional love. You're not coming with forgiveness. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that will limit you from doing this work. And I think that me and Elise and Angie has understood that and found that. Yeah. So like for these researchers, who's doing this type of work or going into these black and brown communities, understand what these people have been dealing with and are dealing with. Yeah. We talking about 16, 17 year olds who's, who's just going through it on a daily, who's hungry, all types of trauma, has to worry about going home two blocks away if they're going to get into some shit or not. You know, um, I want to add something to what Basim is saying, because race is such a critical component. I'll give you some examples. Um, you know, Elise is amazing, you know, but when we first met her, you know, the idea of like having to give these stories of the hood to like a white woman, all kinds of questions went through all our minds because we used to sit and talk like, how can we trust Elise? Mm -hmm. Should we trust her? We used to sit in circles, the team, and we used to be like, all right, but she did this for us. And she did that. She didn't pull back on her word here. It was very hard for us to think that a white woman would be on our side, <laughs> especially when we're sharing things that most people would think were like self-imposed, like bad decisions. I don't know. I don't know if you can like you understand what I mean, Matt. But um, yeah, completely. She really did help us get through that. And for the first time ever, even me as like um, somebody who runs like the field in the underground worlds in circles for the first time ever, I was able to sit even with a woman and just tell her what me as a woman, I go through navigating these worlds. So for the first time ever, we were bridging all kinds of gaps. So I, that's why I loved it when Elise was like, man, this is supposed to fill a whole bunch of gaps of knowledge. And she's right. <laughs> and, and I think we see it at like every phase. And when Basim says that she's out in the streets, that was a year of her working and building out relationships and trust so that she could even get to the point that she's at now. Part of what I have seen, I mean, aside from all the personal growth that I also have gone through. It's basically like all of us 
And so many people that I know in so many different areas want change and can even diagnose the problems, but there's something about having space for conversation and dialogue about them with people who are different from you. That piece of it is missing. You know, like deep conversation, deep listening. That to me is almost the transformative part of this above and beyond the research is that like us being able to sit and really talk about some of this stuff and get to the other side. I, I don't even think it's like a side. I just think it's yeah. like just the start of it and then having an understanding yes. of each other and where we're coming from. Again, like I could go back on, like I know Elise probably have had her own interpretations of what the gang life is like or people who are a part of it and what they actually do in it, right? And I, I believe Angie did too. And this is why mm-hmm. like, Angie, like for this to really work for me, Angie had to go in death, right? So when I mean in death, like I'm not talking about that surface bullshit. Like Angie as a researcher, and I believe the only researcher period in the United States right now has went that deep into these hitting populations. And when we talk about hitting hitting populations, that's nothing new. This is nothing new. The Underground Railroad is a hitting population. You know what I'm saying? This is, these hitting populations is embedded and and rooted in our blood. You know what I'm saying? For survival, Underground Railroad, for survival. Underground economy, for survival. Right. Like people have to understand that and what that means. So for Angie, for her to even understand, to even to even go out in these in this population to even understand and not judge, she had to go deep. And when I'm talking about deep, like I took her deep. I took her into the traps. I took her into the like the hitting side parties, the side blocks or whatnot, to the crit parties, to the blood parties, to the powwows, to the meetings or whatnot. So she can understand what she's getting involved with. Right. And she can understand how or create, because she's great at creating structures and approaches, right? So how can she, as a researcher, create an approach that can mix with my gangster understanding and also bringing in the least, how can we create something to approach these gangsters to have them buy into what we need them to buy into. And then understand that like, if you're gonna create anything that you wanna help any black or brown community, you have to be in that community to understand what to create to help them. Understand that these streets change all the time. What happens two months ago is not happening right now. Yeah, and that's been, I mean, honestly, from just from my angle, that's been, probably the most challenging thing about doing this at a place like CCI because, and we talk about this a lot among the team is like the more supportive infrastructure you have for things like budget to be able to get, you know, large sums of money and manage those and whatever. It also comes with a lot of um, structure, I guess, that you have to work within and it is not a fast moving structure. The street moves quicker than a large nonprofit, you're telling me? <laughs> yeah, you can show it here. Super, yes. super, like super. Yes. All right, so Angie, you, you were gonna you were gonna tell a quick story, I think. So um that day on the field we had Bam, Javante, Basim, and I. I was conducting an interview, Bam was conducting an interview, and um, Basim was managing the crowd because we had a large crowd that day. I'm literally interviewing a participant, and in the middle of my questioning, an officer comes and snatches the participant right out of the interview. So this is already, there's a lot of things happening right now. There, uh, there's obviously a reason on the street why this DA is coming to, to take my participant, but now I have an issue of exposing my participant as, you know, a gun carrying youth in this area. So, yes, the, you know, those two things are in my head right now. And suddenly it becomes an actual scene like his brother comes towards the, the cop to start. And Basim and I like instinctively know what to do. Basim goes straight 
to the the DA to start talking about the research and what we're doing and that these are our participants. And I go straight to hold the brother back. Now, for most researchers, your, your main instinct may be to just shut down the site because there's been an issue and go home. But that's the part where we have to be more responsible and more conscious. And we don't shut down the site because what does that read to the community if you just shut down when things get bad? That reads to the community that you're not there to walk with them as they're going through their day-to-day struggles and that you're not there to understand what it really means to be targeted. And we've had incidents on the field where even a police officer came to pull, to pull Basim. And in that moment, you can think a researcher brain, which is shut down the site and leave the area. Or am I going to stay in my, in my truth, right, and make sure that my researcher is safe from this officer? And these are the negotiations that that we have to make that are different than, I guess, a typical, like, maybe research project. And that all depends on the person, on the person themselves. And I think that the pandemic has showed us even more that this method is really important because it is a different type of medicine we're creating. Watching our people suffer during this pandemic is really what is motivating us to keep going, even though all the odds are against us. If we turn to look a little bit of the, you know, the findings that you guys got, just how widespread did you guys discover is experiences of of violence and and really deep violence among this community? Extremely widespread. You know, so in terms of, so we talked to 330 people who were between the ages of 16 and 24. Most of them were men by 80%, but we did talk to 20% women. And that's also like a pretty high number given the research that exists. So we found, you know, of those, so all, like many, many, many had been shot. Many had been arrested. Many had had a family member shot. So we're talking 80% had been shot or shot at. 88% had a friend or family member shot. 70% had witnessed somebody being shot. It's very pervasive. So that's kind of one angle of this picture. On the other side, you have all sorts of systemic violence, and in particular cops, like police violence. And so they're the people that they're in theory relying on to protect them are harming them. So the thing that they do to protect themselves, which is carry a weapon, makes them vulnerable, both more vulnerable to the cops and more vulnerable to other people on the street. I mean, think about it like this. So for most white communities, the police provide the protection structure in communities where the police are the perpetrator, another protection structure is required. I mean, when, when you say the police are the perpetrator, you're, I mean, you're talking about the finding that you guys had that a primary reason that young people are carrying guns in these communities is because they're afraid of being killed by the state. They're afraid of being killed by police, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, they talked about, you know, 30, 35% say police try to protect the public from violent crime. So only 35% believe that that is something the police even try to do. 20% only think that the police want to understand community needs. And 15% only think that police have good reasons when they arrest people. 15%. And I mean, they, you're talking about a community that's had extremely widespread experiences of arrest, of, of incarceration, of themselves, of their family members, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, 88% of them had been arrested. So most of these arrests are for very, very low level crimes. So this is like the stop and frisk stuff. And beyond that, you know, there's just a lot of what, you know, sort of like petty harassment, like stories of the police coming up to cookouts and just dumping water on the grills. It's not just harassment, even it's sort of like provocation. So over and over. So it's like, how do you, you know, they, their stories are how do how, basically like, how do I position myself against this kind of this kind of force coming at me when I'm being tri- treated like, I mean, the words they use are criminal, demon, animal. Like they understand the message loud and clear. Sorry, you mean the words that police are using? Or? Yeah. Yes. That's the words the police use to them. And those are the words that the participants use to describe how the police treat them. They'll gun you down for anything. You know, that's a direct quote. So, I mean, you know, it's clear from listening to you guys and from the report, I mean, that there's there's so much trauma going on, individual trauma and kind of a, a collective trauma. How is trauma factoring into the decisions that young people are making about guns? 
they talk, we have them describing sort of localized fear, whether it's like the police are going to attack me or what they call ops, but you know, basically like enemies in other rival gangs are going to come. Ops for opposition, right? So it's like we're in a, uh-huh. like people are thinking of themselves as in a war zone. Yes. Exactly. It's the language of war. And then there is a generalized fear, which is like at any time, just uncertainty, the sense of like anything could happen at any time. And I think you can look at that when you're talking about trauma, you can look at that from an, as in maybe like hypervigilance, but then there is a reality to that as well, which is anything kind of could happen at any time. It's very hard, I think, to piece out like what is trauma reaction, which I think is really sort of like a psychological thing or, or um, a wellness thing. And what is a, a reasonable or a, a logical reaction to a set of circumstances that people live in? If you grow up in an environment that's hostile, you have to develop certain type of skills to survive. And if you're completely always in survival mode, a lot of our people end up like really stuck in the reptilian part of their brain just so that they can make it hour to hour. I think anybody with sense could really understand if they were in those conditions that they themselves might make the same choice to hold a gun and survive. And then we got to even go a little, think a little bit further than that. What about the children and what they're are absorbing in and how's that affecting them and like taking away from their development? For me, that's big. That's big for me. That's big for me. I think, Mm-hmm. I think that like all this shit that's happening in these neighborhoods that we describe and and what the study described has effect on our youth at a younger age than we think. And then think about the pandemic. So remember that that project, the project we're talking about, it happened before the pandemic. Now with the pandemic, the world is literally not the same. And if anything, the pandemic exposed all the contradictions in our society even more. So this is why I think our project and our mission is really important, because if we don't start getting creative now, trust me, the structures that they have in place are going to outrun us. They're going to outrun us there. There's like. It's a little it's a little overwhelming, to be honest. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, I love all my hidden communities, but I would never want to romanticize a gangster's life because it is hard to be a gangster. Aside from the bling and all that, it is hard. And our kids are not in school. Mm -hmm. Our kids have no access to food. Our first participants in this new project we found because they were stealing Hagen dogs ice cream to sell for money. So yes, I, you know, we, there were a lot of flashy stories from last year, but we we all unraveled in a lot of ways. Like we had to really like reflect. I hope that this research, I hope that we can teach more people this style of research because this pandemic is not over. We have many crises before us. And if we're open-minded, we may be able to help a lot of people if we just are courageous enough to think differently. Yeah, I mean, on that topic of thinking differently, there's a lot of people working in the, you know, anti-violence space, whether it's governments at all levels with their policies and certainly funders and, and nonprofits such as the one that, that we all work for. What would you guys want as like the biggest takeaway for people doing this work? What I see is um, a lack of really contending and listening to the needs and the desires of the community. You know, it's, it's hard because there are many different pockets or sort of constituent groups in every community. But if we are talking about gun use, we have to be talking to and really putting into position of leadership, positions of leadership, people who who live that. Right. You know, I think far too often it's like well-meaning people like me, and I am well-meaning, you know, and I'm not stupid, but putting out what I think is the best approach or the most important thing or my priorities and you know people are dying every day I think for me it's like like understanding like what community you're talking about (laughs) like 
if we're talking about helping, it's only one community in America that needs help. And that's the black and brown community. Mm. So when we're talking about community, understand we're talking about brown and black communities, period. One of the major recommendations, it seems like that comes out of your report, is that if you want to do effective anti-violence stuff, you got to listen to the community and you need to invest in strategies that come out of that community that do not involve the police. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, because there, there's always this, you know, and it's interesting because you say like it's the black and brown community. I guess what I'm thinking about when I say they're different constituent groups is there are many people, even in Crown Heights, for instance, who are saying we can't defund the police because to take the police out of the neighborhood means that we will have increased risk or increased danger. And I guess what, what I'm thinking is, even if we're talking to people in professional classes, their perspective is going to be different than even gang, like for instance, gang leadership, which is another one of our, you know, our recommendations is get gang leadership involved. The, you know, get the shooters to tell you why they are picking up the gun and what can help them to put it down. And let's give them the jobs to do all the interventions, you know, like, like look at it as a job creation strategy, especially since we know not just our study, every study that exists basically indicates poverty and lack of access to well-paying and you know, living wage jobs is a major driver of involvement in the underground economy and gun use. I mean, do you guys come away from this work and the really deep way that you've done it feeling like the problems of gun violence are just intractable? I mean, it's just like going to be too hard to solve or do you come away with it feeling like there is a path and we feel like we're on it? I come away from this feeling like it's going to be hard work and we have to do it every day. And this is work that's not going to be just fixed in this generation. All of our ancestors have been doing this work and it's like they're just passing down the baton and now it's our turn. It's our turn not to be the weak link. So will I see big changes in gun policies as soon as we need them, which was like yesterday, three years ago, 10 years ago? I try not to focus on that because I don't want to get discouraged. So I just say that this work is bit by bit. That's what I take away from it. As a whole, no, because I understand the culture and I have learned about the culture of gun violence and the relationship between that with America itself. Mm. But for me, on the individual level, as me talking with participants that is one at a time, or such as them was stealing across the street, stealing the ice cream, and, and they could have went to jail or whatnot, or they could have got fucked up by the dudes on the block. But no, we was able to bring them in into our space, was able to get them to do the interview, and we paid them $30 and we fed them. So for me on that, and then they still return every day. And they're coming back. To our mm -hmm. space, you know what I'm saying? So for me, on the individual level, that's where I'm more vulnerable, more uh, motivated, more um, enlightened, more encouraged that, yes, change on the, on the macro. No, that's, that's what we're working towards. Mm -hmm. But on the individual, yes, yes, because... One at a time, eventually you're going to have an army of these mindsets of change, right? Right. And I believe we're really doing that work. I believe we did that in firearms and we continue to do this now. We're learning more about ourselves and about people. Mm -hmm. Take as much as the trauma away from them as possible. So, yes, for me, yes, my, my work goes beyond just the hours of just the study, you know what I'm saying? Like my, I, I go out in the neighborhood, as soon as I'm gone, they still, we right on the block with them, right? Still having these conversations and chilling and talking and shit and smoking and whatnot. But also having these conversations about their lives and where they want to be at, challenging them on that. Mm. For me, that's where I see the change that is happening and will continue to happen people understand like this is the way it works 
not the way you think it should work. Mm. Yeah, you know, and I think um, one of the things I think we have all learned is that I think policymakers tend to think of this as like, I don't know, like an antisocial thing or like a, something that's based in individual decision-making, just make a better choice. Just choose to put the gun down, choose not to be a criminal and get back on the right track. You know, you hear that, over, that language over and over again. And what it doesn't ever get is that the realities that people live in that are putting them in a position where they feel like this is their only choice to not get killed. Okay, so number one, like that's the, that is the context. They're trying to live, number one. Number two, what we have found, I think, just we have like stumbled into it, I think really by accident, is that the most powerful intervention strategy is conversation, helping them feel connected, helping them feel like there are places that they can take these deep kind of personal experiences that they don't have a chance to talk about and to share them with people who are not like a court mandated therapist. You know, like who people who live their neighbors, their community, like give give a community space where they can share things and and start to build out a different vision for what what their lives can look like and what their lives can be. You know, people use the word empowerment or things like that. And I I don't think that's it. It's like just create the space, you know, just create a space where they can be who they they already know that they are. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like, it's not, it's not a policy decision coming down from on high that is like, here are, here's the one, you know, driver that if we just take away, if we just take this away, it's like a, like a, not a necessarily even like a material thing, even though that is part of it. It's also an emotional thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's a, right. Right. a, a sense of being part of something bigger than you right. that cares about you and loves you. I just want to say thank you so much. To all three of you, Basim, Angie, Elise, it's interesting reading the report. It's very clear all the work you guys had to do to build trust, you know, to bridge over to the people that you are working with. I hadn't really understood until this conversation the work you guys did to sort of build trust amongst yourselves as well. I mean, I want to thank you in that same spirit for, you know, having the trust in me to share some of your thoughts and, and share some of what you've learned doing this really amazing work. So... Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. That was my conversation with Angelica Maria Camacho, Basim Spate, and Elise White. They are three of the people behind the report, Gotta Make Your Own Heaven, Guns, Safety, and the Edge of Adulthood in New York City. I'd also like to acknowledge the other authors of that work, Rachel Swanner, Andrew Martinez, Javante Alexander, Lissandra Webb, and Kevin Evans. To read their report uh, and for more information about today's show, click the link in your show notes or go to courtinnovation.org slash newthinking. Special thanks for this episode to Vivian Watts. The show was edited and produced by me. Samiha Mia is our director of design. Emma Dayton is our VP of outreach. Our music is by Michael Aaron at quivernyc.com. And our show's founder is Rob Wolf. This has been New Thinking from the Center for Court Innovation. I'm Matt Watkins. Thanks for listening.